John, am I? Oh, yeah, I'm on. Okay. Um, so before I start, I just point out that the skeleton up here is not a real skeleton. I always show fake bones at first, but I'm going to have a disclaimer. There will be human remains. And I, I often put that out there because I work a lot with indigenous groups and other groups, and sometimes people do leave because they don't want to see human remains, but hopefully none of you are going to go here. This is actually a skeleton that used to sit in my lab. So earlier, Carla was asking me, what's the weird thing in the pelvis? I'm like, that's a pole, <laughs> some bungees. But uh, I 3D modeled it and then sketched it out for fun. Um, just real fast, before we get started, really this is a series dedicated to Joan Crawford. It was here before I got here, but when I got here, I thought we should restart it. So just something about the legacy she has here. She joined the faculty of Garrett College in fall of 1972 and would remain at Garrett College for more than three decades as faculty member in the Humanities Department Chair and Directors of Admissions. After retiring from Garrett College, Professor Crawford was a volunteer teacher at local nursing homes, the Mary Browning Senior Center, um, teaching creative writing and memoir writing. She also served at the Board of Garrett's Arts Council and the GLAF and Habitat for Humanity and Appalachian Crossroads, so she did a lot, right? And so this is just to kind of commemorate her and keep this series going. The other thing I have to do real fast is the Maryland uh, Arts Commission got together and started making land acknowledgments for every county. So this is the land acknowledgment they did for us. So we acknowledge that the Yakagani River Band of the Shawnee continues to maintain relationships with the lands where we gather today. The Yakagani River Band of Shawnee has stewarded these lands and waters for generations. The Shawnee people maintain maintained a nomadic tradition prior to the start of European settlement, regularly renewing relationships with the land across the eastern seaboard. The Akagani River Band of Shawnee are still here and share this land with all visitors to it. With them, we uninvited visitors honor these lands and we carry the memory of and joys and tears of loss. So there's a couple other groups that um, Director Messler and I are working with to kind of show the other groups in the area, but that's a different lecture. So. Um, again, here's the disclaimer, there'll be human remains. So here's the first set of human remains. This is a 3,000 year old site in North America where they have skull surgery. So my friend, Diana Simpson, who went to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, like me, has worked on this area before and she kind of was um, analyzing some of this. But it's pretty cool. We often think some of these indigenous groups weren't all that sophisticated and that's the European narrative, right? Like primitive noble savage, all these terms that get thrown around. I mean, they're doing brain surgery out on the Aleutian Islands. They were mummifying people and doing stuff and they knew the anatomy better than a lot of people did until like medicine was getting really well established. And I'll talk about mummies here in a minute, but I just kind of want to put that out there that what I'm going to try to do is give you a couple snapshots of how we can identify indigenous heritage in North America using the human remains. Now, the title of my talk has Reading the Bones. This gentleman up here who passed away, uh, his name is George Melagos. So he's like my academic grandfather, which is kind of weird. He, he trained my professor who trained me, and I worked with him right before he passed away. He's done a lot. He trained many, many bioarchaeologists in the country. There's basically two schools of thought. Um, and he always called it reading the bones, right? Like, it's a diary. We can tell all kinds of stories from the bones. How, what stories we tell depend on what, what time frame we're working on. So archaeologically, it's bioarchaeology or osteoarchaeology if you're in England, interchangeable terms. If you're in a legal setting, you hear the word forensic anthropology thrown away, or thrown around, thrown away. <laughs> but that is when they're working on cases where there's actual, like, somebody could be prosecuted. And then medicine, it's paleopathology, and that all just means old diseases. And what I'm going to do is a mixture of those two things. Um, forensics a little bit because I still, I study trauma and things well on that nature, but really going to look at skeletal biology, paleopathology, and create that field of bioarchaeology. There's other fields of biological anthropology, primatologists like Jane Goodall is an example. There's people that study just human biology, so like I have a friend that studies placentophagy or eating the placenta. Is that a common human practice? Interesting story for a different time. Uh, I have friends that study breast milk production and lactation lactose tolerance, and just a range of things, but that's all human biology. And paleoanthropology is the old stuff, studying things like Homo naledi, Neanderthals, that kind of stuff, right? Bioarchaeology, a book written by Deb Martin, me and somebody else, no, Ventura Perez, he's amazing, he's a colleague of ours. Uh, we all wrote this book, um, really, the, to kind of give somebody ethics 
on what to do when they find human remains, kind of how we should proceed in the field. It's a little dated now, it's 2013. It just came out in Korean. If you read Korean, you can go ahead and read that. I don't read Korean, so I hope it's translated right. I don't know. Uh, but this book, we're thinking about doing a second edition. That's why I was teasing Ventura. He was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do it or not, but I'm going to convince him that's the plan. But, come out with kind of a revision. And the reason for that is just if you look at some of the subtitles, we're talking about scientific racism and NAGPRA and things like that. But NAGPRA is a law about what you do with human remains. It came out in 1990. There was a law that had to be passed because you used to be able to go and dig up native remains and just keep them, right? Like, hey, I've got these bones. They're ours. They had to take a federal law to change that, right? So now we have a law that says, no, you can't do that. NAGPRA says you have to return them. One of the benefits of that NAGPRA law is not only were the remains returned, it motivated a bunch of people to study those remains before they went back. And there was like, there's an estimate by a couple of people that says somewhere between 70 plus percent of the remains had never even been analyzed. They just sat in boxes for sometimes 100 plus years. Bioarchaeology, this is uh, coming out of England, but human remains in archaeology, you'll see that one of the things I'm going to talk about is none of this works when we don't have the archaeological context, right? You need to know where the remains are situated. And I bring that up because those human remains sitting in boxes, a lot of that context was lost. Somebody in the 1800s, hey, I found a body. Gave it to the Smithsonian, right? That's not super helpful. Like I have no, I can tell you a few things, but I don't know all this stuff, right? And I'm, I'm gonna show you some examples of how important it is to know the context so you can see why we want that. I'm gonna talk about five things, that's my goal is I'm going to talk about what we can reveal with bioarchaeology. I'm going to start with migration, because that's a big question. People want to know where do people come from, where did they move to, who are they related to. And then I'll talk a little bit about ideology, spirituality, and religious practices. This is probably the hardest, but we can infer from certain things. And then all the stuff in the orange is stuff that I've done projects on, so I'll just focus on myself. A little narcissism in there, right? <laughs> Individual identity and regional differences, social complexity, and then violence and warfare. Each one of these topics just kind of gives us an idea of like, if we look at the bones, are we able to answer these questions? First off, when we talk about migration to the new world, there's two dominant theories. There's time immemorial and there's Beringia. Time immemorial is the indigenous belief that they are from this land and they've always been here. And I'm gonna talk about how that's true. Um, Beringia is the idea that they crossed over from Siberia 15,000 plus years ago and then came here. I'm gonna say scientifically, that's also true. But I'll talk about different ways that works. In Beringia, there's two ways to do this. The ice-free corridor and the Pacific coast, that's highly debated. I have colleagues that that's what they spend their career arguing about and publishing about. I'm not gonna argue and publish. I think both are true, so I just, uh, I'm gonna say what I think. Uh, when we say the word time immemorial, it just means that people are here for so long they can't remember a history when they weren't here. Now that could be a thousand years, but if you ask somebody 15,000 years ago if their ancestors were here then, that's time immemorial, right? That's forever. You've always been on this land. 5,000 years is forever. That's 15,000 years is way older than the pyramids, right? It's way older than anything you could think of. The Bible with what some of the history that's written, I mean, that's being written about that's still not that old, right? I mean, some of it talked about that's older. But we're talking about a really, really long period of time. So when somebody says, we've always been here, they've always been here. Now, Beringia, from an archaeological perspective, is this huge thing, often called a land bridge, which I think is kind of silly. I mean, just given scale, Alaska is huge, largest state in the United States, right? When we talk about land bridge, it's not like people knew they were on a bridge, right? This is thousands of miles, <laughs> and like, that's huge. There's no way you're like, oh yeah, look at the bridge. Uh, they were just moving from one part of the world to another without a real concept that, hey, we're crossing over into the Americas now, right, over this bridge. It's a little misleading. Um, people lived on Beringia. Some of uh, the colleagues I work with are doing underwater archaeology up in this area. Well, the mouse doesn't work. Oh. Anyway, they're diving off the coast of Alaska to look for sites and looking for artifacts, which is really cool. Harder to do when you have small artifacts you're looking for, but they found some stuff. The two ideas about how people got here are they went down through what we call the ice-free corridor. There's continental um, glaciers that block one part of the North American continent and the other part. And at one point that opens up a couple times and so people went down through there. That's true and so we know that happens because we have mammoth that get through, mammoth and sail down, right? We have mastodon, all kinds of other things. 
Um, but there's also a coastal migration route, and that says that people were sailing and fishing and mar maritime stuff all the way down the coast. There's also evidence for that. So both of them, in my opinion, are true. Now, again, people debate which one's more true than the others. It's not my debate. Uh, old sites, though. We had 14,000 years before present. Cactus Hill, Cooper's Ferry is 15,000 years before present. Galt is in Texas, 5,500 years before present. Metacroft is just up here. You should go visit it if you get a chance. It's up in PA. They have a museum, they have an interactive thing. It's one of the oldest sites in North America. Pretty cool, I'd go visit. I haven't even visited yet, I'm going to. 14,000 years before present. Monte Verde is down in uh, Chile, 14,200 years before present. Page Lotson, Paisley Cave, Topper. Topper is in this area too. Really, really old sites that people have been here a long time, right? This is a, the, I'd argue that as of now, the oldest set of human remains found in North America, 13,000, 12,005, somewhere in that range. You can see the range up there with the skull at the bottom. The rest of that's like paleoclimate data you don't even know about. But this young female is old. So we have recovered her body and they've done DNA analysis on the remains. They took her tooth, the far left right tooth, the D tooth, that's an elephant tooth, it's not, it's a species of elephant, but they did DNA analysis on that too. But they did DNA analysis on her DNA, or her tooth, extracted it, ran some DNA, and were able to extract DNA, and she's found to be related to indigenous people still living here today, right, 13,000 years ago, which is awesome. In a different talk, I talked about some controversies where people tried to argue that wasn't the case with a different set of remains. They've run DNA on that set of remains now, same thing. They have living descendants that are related to this person. Oh yeah. 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 There was all. Like, you, no. So you're, you're thinking of there's some people tried to argue they came from Europe over yeah. the European argument. There's no da data for that. In fact, I can answer that question. So we'll, we'll look at migration and genetic ancestries. There's three ways to do this. You can get nuclear DNA. This is autosomal DNA, DNA is another way for it. It's becoming more popular, but it's really, really hard to get really good preserved DNA. They're doing it, but I know people that work on this. This is tricky. So I'm working on a set of human remains that are 1,000 years old in Alaska. My friend's running the DNA from the University of Kansas, and she's She's like, maybe we'll have enough to get that. I mean, that's, the preservation has to be really good. Mitochondrial DNA is the one they've used for a long time. This is passed down through the mother. And then Y chromosomes obviously passed down through the father, but you can tell both different stories, right? What they did with her was pulled her DNA and they traced it back. And she is the one at the top, D1. D is a really common one that shows up here. And then ancestral is M. If you look where M is, it's kind of in like Saudi Arabia area on that map. That's where her ancestry goes back to a long time ago. All of our ancestry just quickly goes back to L. If you look where L is on that map, it's in the heart of Africa, but that's a different lecture, a different time. But just know that all the DNA, so the answer question, yeah, there's no DNA that shows European. The, what they used to use was X, and you can see this X is orange and it goes over, but it's found in Asia as well, so. Yeah there's, yeah, there's some people that have, there's some later South American contact that's pops, that seems to, it's debated, no, no, it's debated that the, but there is more, I'm a fan of it, I think it's neat, there's some evidence that Polynesians might have made it over, but that would have been much later in time, slightly before contact, but still. Um, and is another one, just ice-free corridor thinking, this is Montana, so this is another set, oh, really old set of human remains, 12,500 years before present. They ran DNA on that individual as well. Came back, same thing, right? Related to, so the point of that is that we now know, hey, they migrated from Siberia. They've been here for 12,500 years. Time immemorial, right? We've established these things as true. Cool thing about Anzic is they actually laid that child to rest. So it had been in a museum since, when was it in the museum, it says in here? 1968, they discovered the set of human remains and it sat in a museum curation archive for a long time. I've done several repatriations. That's a common thing where thing, human remains have been sitting there for a long time and nobody looked at them, just the way it was. Or somebody would looked at them and they did one study and then 
you know, years later we have DNA, so they were able to do this. But those have been repatriated, along with a lot of the other remains. But we now have multiple um, data points to show, that, you know, people have been here a long time. So we can track it. Fun fact for Western Maryland is the oldest sites in Western Maryland date at least with projectile points, but they date to close to that time, let's say at 10,000 years old. Those are some old points found in Garrett and Allegheny County. So people have been here a long time too, right? Oh, is it the same um, Yakagani River Band Shawnee? I don't know. That's a question. We could run DNA if we had human remains and find out. But again, either way, human remains have been here a long, or people have been here a long, long time. Switching from migration, because migration studies are interesting, but not always to the indigenous communities. Sometimes people have done things. There isn't a case where they took some DNA and ran some of those studies like that without permission, and it became a trial case after that, because they had DNA for health reasons, still get diabetes and stuff like that, and then they were like, hey, let's also run this thing. Uh, anyway, uh, ideology, spirituality, and religious practice. Sometimes cult groups might want to know a little bit more about that. So throughout much of human history, bones have not been associated with death, but with life. People use the bones for all kinds of things. And we'll talk about it a little bit. Bones can carry mystic powers, ranging from cure to divination to birth and rebirth. I mean, Halloween time, we always talk about witches and bones and all those things. But Lots of groups use the bones. There's groups that take out human remains and people touch them and they do things and then they rebury or reinter those remains. Many cultures believe the body can be reanimated, therefore the bones are often essential to rebirth, so you preserve them. Sometimes you're never supposed to touch them again. I mean, it just varies culture to culture. You can't photograph bones in some cultures. You can't touch them or do anything with them. It, it really does vary. Oldest set, uh, oldest mummies in the world don't come from Egypt, but they come from Chile, right? So there's these really old mummies in South, South America. They're about 5,000 year old um, set of human remains, uh, woman mummified in the black style as shown in the picture. There's some older ones, there's two different styles that they do. This is an artist reconstruction of what the site looks like in Chile, where the people would have been living. And these are the actual mummies. So they've taken photos of the mummies they're different than Egyptian mummies. They're not wrapped in linen cloth and all that. There's some straw. They change the bodies. It, they do some plaster. Um, it looks like they were brought out and used for rituals. Like they look to be moved around and handled, not just stationary. And so some thoughts about what this would mean. Um, the Chinchurro mummies are fascinating. If you want to know more, Ariazo and others have written a lot about these individuals. But definitely, when you're doing stuff like mummification, you're preserving bodies, you're maybe interacting with the dead, that has a lot to say about what you believe the dead are doing, right? Whether it's connecting with ancestors. I, uh, I tell my students all the time, like, people do all kinds of interesting things with the dead. Some people bury them in the house floors, so the ancestors would be under the floor. Some people, you know, put them on sky burials and do all kinds of interesting things. Some people scaffold. I mean, it's just different. So each time we look at a set of human remains, we have to think about these mortuary practices, religious practices. Tibetan sky burial would make it difficult. I mean, that's where you crush up the bones at the end and throw them to the sky, right? And feed them to, it makes it really difficult to find bones. Cremations are incredibly hard to do. Um, I know some people working on cremations right now, that, I mean, but some people cremate their relatives, right? Bone still survives. Um, this is a recent one that they found and they describe as the couples. So. This is a pair, uh, two people buried next to each other, kind of in an embrace. I love when you find these because you know that that was done before death, obviously, right? Because there's, there's one burial where they intertwined a woman's fingers with some children's fingers, right? And so they think mother with her two children. I used to use that picture a lot, but my kids were that age and my wife was about that age. And I was like, oh, maybe that's like a disturbing picture to use. <laughs> anyway, but it was cool because it was like the symbolism of how important those people were to each other in the community. When we're reading the bones, we have to think about preservation of the bones. Not always are they going to be preserved like that. Depending on some conditions, you won't have any preservation. A lack of context if they're removed. Unknown population standards. We always have to think about who we're looking at. Individual variability. Variability in sexual dimorphism, or how big men are and how small women are. And the importance of cultural relativism. And I say all that because I worked on a set of human remains in Idaho that were historic. They were crossing, essentially, the Oregon Trail and they died, and when they were found, they were described as a man and a woman. One was big, one was smaller, and they were, one was dressed in more of like cowboy type clothes, western clothes, and the other one wasn't, so it was man and woman. 
my colleagues and I have all looked at this. We tried to run DNA, we couldn't get viable DNA. But I think it's two women. And one of my, the, the consensus is indeterminate on the one. We can't determine sex, but I lean towards woman. I, we're writing about these two individuals now. But the immediate assumption was a man and a wife because of our own cultural ideas about who would be buried together, right? But we don't know who they were. One of the things I'm not even talking about in this talk is like two-spirit or transgender identity in Native American groups is really common in a lot of groups. So who knows? But that, again, Western. But when we see things, we often do place our own cultural ideas about couples or a mom and her kids. Some of the burials that were look like a mom and a child aren't even related. Sometimes they're or related distantly because sometimes that doesn't matter in a culture, right? Cultural values. Now, thinking about that, we're going to talk about this for a minute. This is something I tried to get my wife to let me do to my kids. She said no. <laughs> I'm like, come on. I, used to, I did this talk with my son when he was little, and he's like, yeah, I don't think so. It would have been awesome, but she said no. But Peruvian male, now he has cranial binding and trepanation. Well, we're going to talk about the trepanation. Remember that skull at the very beginning had cranial surgery. That's what healed cranial surgery looks like. This is a cast of this individual. There's several of them found. 2,000 years ago, they took obsidian, they scraped the skull and exposed the brain for whatever reason, right? So some people were like, oh, it's religious to release spirits. I don't know. Maybe they knew about head trauma and intracranial pressure, too. I mean, talking about people that know their anatomy. But the person lived through it, right? There's a couple other examples where somebody had like three and didn't live through the third one. But he lived through this one over 2,000 years ago. Think about cranial surgery now. That's, that's an intensive thing. It's really, really dangerous. Well, they're pathogens, all kinds of things that could cause issues, right? But they were successful at it. Unfortunately, we misrepresent these practices in media, right? If you saw Indiana Jones 4, it's immediately aliens. People have been saying aliens since like the 1800s when they found these individuals. They have a crystal skull, right? The aliens show up at the end. It's like, ah. It, it's sad because Indiana Jones drove this interest in archaeology, and then you're like, I mean, but it is Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, right? I mean, they did E.T. Uh, that is not the case. There's no aliens. I'm not a big fan of anything being explained to aliens, but we won't focus on that. This cultural practice is not just found here, though. It's found in other parts of the world. This is Mesoamerican. Um, different types, too. So some of the groups I'm going to talk about later, I've worked with some of the, what you might consider this top one B, that flattening. That's very common with cradle boarding. If you put a child on a cradle board and they sit against the cradle board, their head's going to be flat. My, my sister will probably kill me. My nephew had some flattening at a different part of his head. They had to get a helmet and kind of reshape. My son had the same thing. He laid on one side of his head, so we had to roll a towel and put pressure and try to reshape his head because we're obsessed with round heads for some reason, right? Most cultures don't care. Or in the opposite, if you're wrapping a child's head to create that, that's a sign of status. That's an important thing. So my friends that study cranial modification, these are cultural practices that mean things. So this is one that Vera Teasler has done. She's done amazing work in Mesoamerica. If you're interested in the Mayan and that kind of stuff, she's the person to go read. Um, but it's also found in Europe, right? One of the things that I'll do in this talk a couple times is refocus us back into the fact that all these things I'm talking about in North America are found in our ancestral populations as well. So this is Germany, Bavaria, Carla, right? <laughs> so very Bavarian area, but look at the heads. They have shaped some of these heads, and some are elongated for different reasons. So you can think about that cultural practice was around, and then it went away. wonder why, right? What, what was the reason? So it's found in lots of different places. You'll see it, Egypt, other places. But my research, looking back at those three questions, was individual identity and regional differences. I started out doing regional stuff, really, and then I focused it back into individuals. I still go back and forth. I think both are interesting, because when you focus on individuals and you know a lot about them, then you can put that in a regional context, and vice versa. Social complexity, I'm really interested in what happens when societies get more complex, and then violence and warfare. At one time, I had a review come back on a book I was writing, and they're like, well, does he write about this stuff? He just writes about violence all the time. I was like, whoa, I'm like not just only my dark, but anyway, that's what I got. Cultural areas in the North American region. I just want to give you a couple ideas where I've worked. So, my thesis started out in the plateau. That's the plateau cultural regions, like Idaho, Washington, Oregon, that eastern side, not the northwest coast. Um, my dissertation was down in the American Southwest, and then I've worked in the Great Basin. I've worked up in Alaska, which is Arctic, subarctic, depending on where you're at. Most of my work is in the subarctic, so lower. Um, but worked all these areas. I had 
worked on one set of human remains from the Great Plains. One of my grad students worked over in the Eastern Woodlands. All were in the Northeast, right? Hootsawani, all the other groups that are in this area. So each one gets broken up, and they're created in these cultural areas in the 1900s because they, they kind of had a suite of similar characteristics. In the Southwest, they had corn, they had turkeys, they had these things. So they kind of created, like, these are the groups based on their environment. It's a little more complex than that, but that's what we're going to do. When we think about individual identity, one of the things we do is create what we call, what Frank Saul called osteobiography. It just means a biography of the bones, right? We are going to write everything we can about this person's life from their bones. This is my thesis, or my dissertation advisor, sorry, Deborah Martin, the book that she worked on a long time ago and then reanalyzed these human remains multiple times over the last 20 years. But we published about this one individual as a female who is approximately 30 years old from the Plata site 65030, you don't even know that, in New Mexico. She had a large cranial depression fracture and a fractured pelvis. The other thing to note is Deb and I have talked a lot about slavery and captivity in the American Southwest. We think she's probably a good example of what a captive burial would look like. Instead of being buried in like a flex position with grave goods, there are people at the site that are buried that way. So, and I'll show you a flex position again in a minute. But she's kind of thrown in there in sort of a way, right? And a lot of these women were younger, and I'll talk about captivity later, but just think about differential patterns of burial, right? When you bury a loved one, and say you put them in a fancy coffin, bury them with their gold watch, whatever it happens to be. Or you find a body that's just kind of in a shallow grave, right? First thing you might think of a serial killer or something like that, which could be. Uh, but the context means a lot. I didn't make that chart, but I did make the graphic <laughs> all the way around. Harper's Weekly image of Chinese workers, and then the chart looking at um, the ways we can reconstruct individual identity requires a lot, right? So you have to think about pathology, genetics, risk factors, living conditions, neighborhoods, institutions, socioeconomic policies. That's much harder to do 5,000 years ago, but we try. I was working on historic Chinese remains that were working on the railroad, people that were living in that time. That was much easier. We had medical records that we could see, like this person that died from a lethal blow to the head matches this person probably that has a historic record about being attacked and hit in the head. But we try to do that as far back as possible, right? It's harder, for sure. The more records you have, the easier it is to read. But then records can lie, too, right? Sometimes people that wrote those records didn't tell the truth. The boarding schools, for example, and that they're working on with indigenous kids in Canada and stuff, there was a lot of lying that happened there, right? And now they're finding bodies with ground-penetrating radars and all kinds of stuff. Just do a quick Arctic one, because this is where I was working last. <laughs> it's really, it's classified as the Arctic culture. It's really sub-Arctic climate. This is not going to tell you the village. This is a village on the coast in the YK Delta, or the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. Um, Four-wheel track, four-wheel track exposed a body. I got called, flew out to the village. I just put the airports out there. You go from one big airport to a little regional airport, and then you're on a little plane that's like landed at the middle of the village, which is really kind of cool. But there's constraints. That blue bag is the only thing I could carry with me. So I had everything I needed to work on this, as well as things that I could show the community. So when I was talking about how I can identify a female versus a male, and I can identify a 30-year-old versus a 50-year-old, I had casts to show them, right? I'd pull them out and be like, look at these. See, this is the difference, and they could see it. So that way they could be involved in some of the research. Um, this individual, we ran some radiocarbon dates on. It's 700 years ago. That, that individual was interred there. We also, my colleague found, the archaeologist found a house pit. She found some pottery down there, rang radiocarbon dates on that. It was like 680 years ago. So, and there were several house pits. So we're like, ooh, this is probably a village site. Had the elders out there. The elders were like, there's the old village. Here's the new village. This is right in between. And the dates kind of match them. And they were telling us, we always thought there was something here. 700 years ago, but they were, you know, thinking about what was there. I had another body that I worked on in Alaska that came into the lab that somebody had had, kind of similar to what we've talked about, Carolyn, that was in their basement, and they're like, my dad had this skull. We don't want it. And so I went to the medical examiner. Medical examiner was like, I don't want it, and look at it for us. So I looked at the skull, analyzing the skull, uh, looking inside, some dirt falls out. My grad student and I are, look at, are working on it. Look down, I'm like, there's two BBs from a shotgun, right? And I'm like, that's not good. So I look at the skull more, and I'm like, oh, there's two entrance wounds on this skull. Now I'm like, is it forensic? Now I'll tell you that there's ways bone break. When bone is old, it kind of is brittle, kind of crumbles. 
when it's new, it's kind of like wood. It peels a little bit, right? Like so you can tell the difference. Fracture patterns are very diagnostic. This looked old. I was like, this looks like it's somebody shot it after this person was dead. Now, I grew up in Utah, Idaho, different places. People go out and shoot random things. I just was like, I bet somebody out there saw something that just took a shot at. That was my guess. So we ran it through some, um, got some radiocarbon dates. Now, they do a new radiocarbon dating. It's called the bomb pulse radiocarbon date, but since the nuclear bombs went off, they can kind of trace how much nuclear radiation there is in the atmosphere, so that was the goal. Is this forensic? If it's in the last 50 years, we're gonna need to do a forensic analysis. Came back, you can see the dates up there. It's about 95% probability of between six to 700 years ago, right, before present. So the probability date they give is 650 plus or minus 30 years. So not forensic, I was right, and somebody shot at the skull after that was exposed, right? But nobody's written about that in textbooks, just so you know. Everybody writes about gunshot trauma. Nobody writes about random people shooting people when they're exposed. But that individual, now we're repatriating. We have an idea where they came from because there luckily was a village name written on the box. I'm hoping that's it, but that's what we're trying to figure out. In the American, Pla or, sorry, the Plateau Cultural Region, I worked on a bunch of collected data, actually. 303 individuals had been analyzed since 1955, let's say, somewhere in the 50s, all the way up until the 90s. That's it, they'd been analyzed, people wrote down things. Some people had done some craniometric studies to see race, uh, and kind of identify groups. They weren't looking at, they were trying to see differences. But they'd done some stuff, but nobody really analyzed all the burials. So I took all the burials and looked at them all together to try to figure out what we could learn, 303 individuals. Um, and what was interesting is the groups that were the most different were the closest to each other in proximity which is opposite what we think. So if you look back at this map, region one, that's a different language group than region two and three. Region two is kind of a different environment than region three. So the question was what was more important. We didn't find a lot of differences. I didn't find a lot of differences between them, but I did find statistically significant differences in the lower legs between the Palouse and Nez Perce and lower leg morphologies related to things like mobility and terrain and what you're doing. And interestingly, that's where I think that's what we have is these different groups. One is sedentary or stays in one area fishing, and the other one much more moving around. I mean, they were bison hunting at different points in Esperus. They actually claimed that, that we hunt bison, and people are like, nah, no you don't. Then they found bison. <laughs> it's like, well, I guess you do hunt bison. Like, that's what we said. Uh, and by the way, the Nez Perce now call themselves Nimi Poo, because Nez Perce is a name Pierce knows that was given to them. They go by, every, most groups call themselves the people in their language, and that just means the people. Anyway, Lewis and Clark went through this area. They talked about them. They, a lot of people didn't see a lot of differences between these groups, but they recognized both of them. And if you've ever heard of an Appaloosa, that's the people that bred those. So the Palouse people, there's a whole Appaloosa horse museum if that's your thing. Um, I, uh, one of the goals that I have is, I've done a lot of regional analysis. I'm gonna talk about my dissertation, but I wanna go back and do more in-depth individual analysis on each site. So I highlight that all the red ones have yet to be done. I'm working on two of them. But the black one was done because I had a grad student who went through and analyzed those sites for me and she published her masters on it. Um, what those words mean, virgin is a branch of the ancestral Pueblo, Cayente is a branch, Mesa Verde, Chaco, they're all different branches and I've worked on human remains from every one of those. Different groups, Virgin River is up by Las Vegas kind of, it's, it's real close to where we're at. Um, Cayente is more northern Arizona, Chaco's true Mexico, the New Mexico, sorry, and then Mesa, Mesa Verde is kind of Colorado area if you've ever been southern Colorado. But she created individual osteobiographies for the two versions. She created the scientific one, like here's the scientific facts, female, 30 years old, that kind of thing, and then she created a, like a narrative that the tribe could have, but she put both in there so they could read it and be like, oh, who is this one? It was a woman, she died in her 30, you know, something that was a little more accessible that you could read without all the jargon. And those we did in conjunction with the Zuni tribes. We contacted the Zuni tribes and said, here's what we wanna do, I already have all the data, can she work on this and go look at the remains again? And they said, yeah, okay, we'll let you do that. You have to come and give us the data. And I was like, sure, and so that was what she did. Ashley went through and reanalyzed all the groups and now I have to do all the rest. I had another grad student working on another site and then she, she's not finishing, which is all right. She's really great too though. Uh, so I'm looking at La Plata sites. These were dug up by Morris. I did a whole presentation just recently on this. I'm not gonna spend much time on it. But the different sites up here, one of them not on the La Plata River, which is interesting, were all excavated around the same time in like 1916. 
and then again in like 1919. So they're a long time ago, right? He's really good for the time. Like he's a decent archeologist and he goes around and excavates. There's a whole article about Morris and he's like the Indiana Jones, the real Indiana Jones of the Southwest. He's an interesting guy. He drove around in his like truck full of gear and went out to these archeological sites straight out of his masters and then out of his PhD. I mean, this guy was kind of like a Kevin Dodge maybe, you know, like he was out there in the field doing awesome work. So uh, the only ones that have really been discussed are site 23 and 22. Those are the bigger sites that happens in our field. We're often more interested in the big sites and the exciting things and all the other people. But I think about people, and I tried to train my students when I was a professor that every single person is important because it's all, they're, we're telling their life, right? We don't, I mean, if you think about history, we don't just care about the king. We want to know about every single person, right? Especially if most of our relatives were not the king or the queen, right? They're, our relatives were, my relatives were definitely the paupers. <laughs> they were not wealthy. One of the things that's here at La Plata is missing kids. There's no kids. They didn't recover them, I don't know. There's also missing other remains. He talks about a bunch of human remains at the site. Only about half of them show up at the museum. Where are the rest of them? There's some stories about what, what happened to them. Maybe they were just not excavated. They looked at them, they left them in the ground, moved on, although they're not there anymore, so I don't know. Missing human remains, but missing children is one. There could be ways of excavation at the time. Kids' bones are fragile, they break. It could be that they were not as interesting, so they weren't collected. Sometimes people didn't collect things. I was talking a little bit before this talk about commingled remains or where they mix people in graves. Those were sometimes collected, but they were not. People didn't spend a lot of time. That's a lot of work to do. My friend is an expert in commingled remains, wrote a book on it. It's intensive work. She spent three years on one collection just trying to put people back together. And I, if I have 100 sets of human remains that are all like individual burials, I'm gonna work on that, right? That's easier, I mean, it's reality. But the question becomes, what about the kids? We often didn't focus on kids for a long time, but doing better. Aztec ruins, the other one I'm working on, it's the one my grad student was working on. And she's, she stopped, which is too bad. Uh, Aztec ruin is the largest site outside of Chaco County. It's about 400 plus rooms. Um, this is pictures of it when I was there. But I just highlight some of them. But that, look at that room with all those grinding, those mortars and pestles, right? The manamatates. They were grinding corn. You could think about that as like a communal activity, but that's a lot of labor too. Imagine supporting the whole community grinding corn. And these things, I, I used to do it at archeology span day with the kids and we'd make them go grind corn for a little bit and they're like, all right, we're done. <laughs> and I'm like, now think about grinding for eight hours a day, right? And grinding so much that there's not, a, it's not in here, but I've seen some of these where they're worn all the way through, right? So your grandmother probably used that same grinding stone that you're using to kind of process all this stuff. Um, we did do one individual from Aztec Rune, uh, my, well, two individuals technically. My grad student and I, Alyssa Willette, she is now an, um, Osteo, or she's now an occupational therapist, so she took her master's here when I got a master's of occupational therapy, and she kind of combines these things, which is kind of cool. But we looked at, at care in the record. And I used to show human remain pictures here, but I don't anymore because I probably shouldn't have shown them the first time. They're published. I mean, you can look at them if you read this book. But this young woman had a fractured pelvis, and it healed offset a little bit. And so we looked at how she would have had mobility, how much mobility she would have, and it would have been very limited. She probably didn't have a lot of mobility on one side. It was atrophied on the one side too, the body, so bones were smaller, less use. So what we were arguing, and several people have been arguing, is people had to have helped people, right? Which is hopefully what we all believe, right? I know some people are skeptical. They don't think, and I'm like, well, I think people care for each other, right, in communities? I hope so. But somebody cared for her. She lived into her 30s and then Passed away. She's not super old, but she lived for a long time. And based on some of the trauma, I think it probably happened at a young age or some reasons because of the way the development of one of the bones was that it likely didn't develop right because of the trauma. Um, but we highlight them to see who these people are. And I'll talk about some more in a second. Looking at social complexity, this is uh, Crow Canyon. This is a reconstruction of one of those Pueblos. This is not as big as Aztec. This would be before that, but that's the people, right? That's what they're shown. You have the cradle board in the image, so you can think about the flat heads in the back. Again, I used to show pictures of the different flattening for these cultures, but I don't do that anymore. Um, turkeys, Thanksgiving recently, these guys, this area, this is where they domesticated them, so thankfully I'm glad they did that. I like turkeys. You see the blue corn in the background, right? Blue corn was domesticated in this region of the world too, or in general region. Um, dogs. Kids are working, parents are doing things. People are working on the roofs. That's big because when we look at these sites, we look at roof fall because that's where all the activity was. People were up there doing things on their roofs and then would go into their house. You don't want all that mess in your house, right? You don't want to grind corn in the house. It'd be messy, 
So you think about what they're doing, but this takes a level of social complexity. Um, the level of storied houses, especially looking at back at Aztec, whoops, if you look at how many stories those are, those are like several stories high. You don't get anything like that in North America, outside of Mesoamerica, until Boston, right? I mean, this is architecture that still stands a thousand years ago. Um, when we look at these cultures, we see lots of complexity. Each one of them is different. My good friend works at the Mogollon. We're, Paula, we're going to a conference together next spring to talk about comparing our individuals from different groups. Um, they have far less violence than what I'll talk about. I looked at 271 individuals from different sites, all within that pinkish area at the top. But we think about all those groups. The Hohokam are interesting because they have ball courts, kind of like the Aztec, where they play that traditional ball game. Um, but all these different groups in the American Southwest. This is a picture of women grinding corn, thinking about to that room. This is by Cushing in 1883. I said picture, it's really a drawing. Cushing drew this when he was working with people. So you can see the women grinding, they're all in that activity. There's some more of those grinding stones from outside. And now I'm over at Pueblo Bonita, which is the largest of these sites. It's 700 rooms. Um, I was just teaching in college and me at the college the other day, and I was asking the kids what these circle rooms are and trying to get them to guess. But those are the communal rooms, the religious ceremonial spaces, the kivas. The biggest one of these is found just outside of Pueblo Bonito. It's just over here, and it's the biggest one in the southwest. So this is a really important place. This would be like the heart of a chiefdom, is what me and others have argued. Um, debates on whether it's that level or not, but this is huge, right? This is really complex society. Um, and we can see that in the bones. So looking back at some of those areas I've looked at, I looked at human remains from Cambaniola, Chaco Canyon, Aztec Ruin, La Plata sites. And the reason is that I wanted, and Wingate's on here too, down off here where she was working, is I wanted to t put them in temporal and spatial kind of comparison. A lot, everybody looked at Chaco, oh, Chaco's so special. But I was like, well, let's look at Aztec, which is later. When people leave Chaco Canyon, they move north to Aztec. When Chaco fells, they head north. And they live there for a while, and then that goes away. La Plata sites are earlier, and then Cambiniola is contemporary, but outside the canyon a little bit. And there's differences between them. I wrote a book, Bioarchaeology of Social Control. Don't read it. No, I don't know. It's based on my dissertation. But what I was arguing was that I think, and I agree with some of the archaeologists that have looked at the site since before I was born, that there was somebody there were people in charge. There was social control that allowed for that formation of those buildings, to the labor control, all those things. That takes a level of control. In classes, I talk about what social control can be. It can be religion. Religion's a good one. If you say, hey, I'm the god, people are like, well, you do what the god says, right? It can be forced. It can be coercive. We see that in some dictatorships today, right? And that's social control. It can be all kinds of things. Um, but w establishing that there are elites there, we always talk about elites, but then one of the questions I, my, my interest is, because of my advisor, is the women. She's been studying gender and archaeology for, I don't know, 30 years, a long time. <laughs> a long time. Uh, but women, were the women's elite, elite or warriors? I'm interested in women warriors. There's a new book coming out right now that's all about women warriors, and it's about archaeological examples of what they think are women that are engaged in warfare. And I highlight this. This is Aztec ruin again, but this... This one at the bottom is a basket shield and a sword. Now, my friend has looked at the shield. She says there's a lizard on it. It looks like a shield. Okay, and that kind of looks like a sword. It could be a digging stick, but it looks like a sword. So they, they argue he's a warrior. I've looked at his body, though. He has no trauma. So if he's a warrior, he's a really good warrior. Because if you're going to hit at somebody with a stick and a shield, you're going to get hit. I'm just telling you. Like, I've looked at a lot of trauma. Uh, I'll show you some examples of that in other places. But, and I cut out the bodies on this so you really can't see them. But, Let's say he's a ceremonial warrior, right? Because this is later site. Pueblo Benito, there's much more trauma among the elites. But then the question is, is that a basket plaque, like they say, or is that not a shield for her? I mean, why is one a shield and why not, right? It's smaller, sure, but she's smaller. I mean, it would be interesting to ask those questions, right? But we don't ask those questions sometimes because we assume women can't be warriors, although we now have Marines. I mean, just saying. Now, we ran DNA on these remains. I did not, so I just clarify, because I didn't want to be, I'm not involved in that at all. I didn't know they were going to do that. But they went in and, without permission and cut up the bones and ran some DNA. Not good, right? But one of the things that came out of that is they found that the site where all these elites were, Pueblo Benito, where they thought it was the men, and men were the important ones, and I've studied the men, it was all the women. You can see the lineage. It's, the genetics says it's going down to the female line. It's a matrilineal society. 
which I feel good about because I think in my book I said it was matrilineal and I believed it <laughs> before the DNA came out. I'm like, yes. But in the Southwest, there's different groups. There are some groups that are patrilineal or passed down to the father, kind of like dominant Western culture. And there are some groups that are matrilineal. And the argument was always that this was elite social control, so it had to be patrilineal, right? But the DNA says no. So now, what about those women? And I, again, I've looked at women and trauma for a long time, but we've looked at rating for women. This is from those sites, um, suggesting rating for women. But what you see is that there are sites where there are more women, and there are sites where there are fewer women. And the question is why? They should be about 50-50, right? If you have an average population and you're having kids, eh, it gets off here or there, but it should be about 50-50, right? And there's a 50-50 chance you're gonna get about those same number of people. Tim Kohler and Kathy Kramer Turner before me had looked at just looking at a bunch of data throughout the Southwest and everything that was published, and they found that there were women being, they argued, being moved from sites. They were obviously putting more women in certain sites, and that was for labor purposes, right? Which is what Deb Martin and I have suggested. And that woman you remember was laying in that grave with a, with a cranial depression fracture and a fractured hip would be what we would argue one of those women being moved. If we were to run isotopes and had permission to run isotopes, we can do isotopic studies that show migrations. You can see people that move from one area to another. So if some of my friends work with the uh, Wari in South America and they can show people being moved in for captives. We don't have that ability here, but the other problem would be if sometimes the isoscape's not that dramatically different. They could all be the same, they'd all be Southwest. Could help, maybe not. Um, other things to think about with social control is you know, capital punishment, right? No, but this is witchcraft, killing, sorcery. Uh, wrote about this with just recently about climate change. Um, I'm gonna talk about massacres here in a minute, but just lead, this just kind of leads up to some of that. There's a debate about why people were massacred in the Southwest. Some people have argued witchcraft. Sometimes it's raiding. I think it's pretty complicated and there's probably different motivations, but I do think witches are a big one. And when we are talking about climate change, in this culture, ethnographically, Witches are able to control the weather. So if you have bad weather, you go kill witches. My uh, friend Rick Chacon works down in South America in um, the Amazon basin and other locations. And he studies witchcraft killings, like modern witchcraft killings. And he's had friends that were, people tried to kill them because they were the medicine man, but for the rival village, they were a witch that was doing something bad to, right? So if your kid gets sick, you don't understand germ theory, you might think somebody put a curse on them or a spell. And then what do you do? You go kill the witch and they get better, right? This person was obviously thought to be a sorcerer, and in Zuni law, they were killed for that. Moving to violence, um, the bioarchaeology of violence has a long history. This is a book I wrote, again, with Deb Martin and Ventura Perez, but this is more of an edited book. We pulled some papers together uh, on the bioarchaeology of violence. It's mostly on the Americas, but I wanted to highlight their other books. And there's a tendency to think about Aztec violence and how violent were the Aztecs and all these things about violence. But then, if you want to read about violence, read Sticks, Stones, and Broken Bones, Neolithic violence, right? Uh, it, they, used to, they call it the bloody Neolithic in Europe. Not a good time. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be there. Or if you're more interested in more modern history, you can read Blood Red Roses and about you know, the Battle of Taunton when their monarchy was switching in England. That was not a peaceful time either. Both of those books, I have in my office, but you can, uh, we can always arrange to get them. But Blood Red Roses, The Battle of Town is an interesting one because they've done things like take out the manuals of for how knights fight and then compared the trauma to them, which is kind of cool. And there's suggestions they may not have been wearing armor and some may have been well-trained soldiers and others may not have been trained soldiers. Could have been disproportionate amount of um, why one side won or not. And that's the thing, we always hear about who wins because we hear from the victors, right? The losers aren't writing history. They're not like, yeah, that was great. We went out on the battlefield, right? It's like, well, we won. Like, we defeated them in mighty battle, right? Like, maybe not. Um, so, bioarchaeology violence, it's been out for a long time. Studies violence, I've done it in different places. Focus hasn't always been on violence, but every one of the groups I've looked at, I've went back and looked at markers of violence. The one was in Great Basin, the Fremont, are a group that, it's what, like the Ancestral Pueblo, who I should have said, Ancestral Pueblo used to be called the Anasazi. We don't use that term anymore, they don't like that term. It's a term given to them by somebody else. But the Fremont were a group in Utah that disappeared, right? Where'd the Fremont go? That was, now they know like, hey, they're still there, like Paiute people, and right, the culture changed. 
But the Fremont and the Ancestral Pueblo border each other, so there's some tension. There's trade between them, there's other things. This is a reconstruction of what Fremont life would have been like. It's a complex society as well, um, but it also has violence. They've looked at violence in lots of different ways. Rock art being one of them. That is a person holding another person's head, right? It's pretty graphic. I mean, you can interpret rock art in lots of different ways. I'm not a rock art expert. Some of my colleagues do this. Look at war shields and I'm just like, yeah, I mean, it looks good. I mean, I'm not an artist, so I can't really, <laughs> I can't weigh in there, but that, that's definitely a head. Uh, trophy skulls from pit house excavations have been found in Utah. They have rock art. They have cut marks, indicative scalping. I've seen that. One of my grad students worked on the cut marks for one of the sites, analyzing them. We cast them. We looked at them, as well as some others. There's actual scalps. I have seen those as well. I think they're repatriated now, but they were in a drawer where they had scalped individuals. Um, and there's disarticulated and processed human remains. Now, I'm going to talk about these disarticulated processed human remains in a couple of places. But those, we call them extreme processing sites. These are places where they like, cut up the bodies into really small pieces, right? And my friend that was working on commingled remains was putting them back together at one site for three years. It was a long time. When we think about violence, lots of proxies to look at it. But we also have to keep in mind that when we talk about violence, I'm a big fan of suggesting that people have been cooperative most of the time. There's just periods of violence, right? There's, no group is inherently violent. You'll just see periods of violence. And usually it's stress times and other things. Sometimes it's actually during good times, too. Never know. But when we look for patterns of violence, we kind of are looking to see if individuals have certain trauma, certain pathological conditions, right? We look between age groups. We look between the biological sexes. Real quick, biological sex is the word we use because I can't tell you gender in the past, right? I have no clue. I have a friend that kind of works on some of that, but I can tell you that biologically, 90% of the time, I can differentiate a man and a woman. 10% of the time, like the one I told you earlier, mm -hmm, in between, right? I still think more woman on that one, but violence, bones with trauma, injury, disease are direct evidence of violence. Then use the age, death, set, pathology, context to identify patterns and subgroups at risk. So if 20-year-old women have most of the trauma, like some of these sites, it's like, hmm, that's weird. Why are the women at higher risk for trauma? Reconstruct history of local regional dynamics, hierarchies. Hey, we need to grind a lot of corn. Maybe we bring in some people. They grind the corn for us. It's going to make it easier. Uh, locate where the power is. Identify individuals that have no trauma or individuals that have really good health. Compare that to people that have really poor health. You can do that anywhere, Boston. Right? You can do it in D.C., any city. You can go to areas, uh, Morgantown, right? There's nice areas with people that are homeless in some places. Uh, link human suffering with specific social arrangements and that initiate and maintain it. So sometimes society allows for these things to happen, right? We allow for certain people to be at risk. I mean, in our country, it was transatlantic slavery, and that lasted a long time before that was finally banned. But then we still had all kinds of things after that. So I looked at cranial trauma. And I looked really, I mean, I looked at both lethal and non-lethal, but we were really interested in traumatic brain injuries, healed cranial trauma. If you get a severe cranial trauma, you're not the same afterward, right? I mean, there's problems, and we know this. We know this since Phineas Gage, and we know this because of all the clinical stuff. We have military survivors of TBIs. We have people that have been injured in accidents. I mean, this is just constantly growing literature on traumatic brain injuries. What we try to do from the skull is look at these people with severe skull injuries and think about where they're located, what would be the cognitive deficiencies. We've worked with neuropsychologists and neurologists to kind of do some of this. The men at Pueblo Benito, the elite men, have a really high rate of cranial trauma, right, in terms of just patterning. It's like, wow, that's a lot. And one woman has cranial trauma. I, different argument. I argued for her to be like maybe a, a warrior, but it's a different talk. But, one of the things we talked about, I talked about with the males is that there's other sites where we see ritual combat, and that's one way to establish and maintain status. That's why I'm skeptical of the warrior in warrior's grave. I do think he's elite, but I think ritual combat might not have been around anymore. It might have been passed down the status. But they might have had to earn the status here. And this site, just so you know, this is, a, I've talked about this burial, but it's, this is about 150 to 330 years of burial occupation. And the oldest burials at this site, the two at the bottom that have all the grave goods, this elaborate grave goods, they are older than the site. So they like founders of this place, right? This is one argument that somebody said based on radiocarbon dates. They're as old or older than the sites. And the last ones at the site have severe cranial 
trauma that's lethal. And I've argued that they might, there's an oral tradition about the end of this gambler who's the kind of deity type guy that makes them build these houses and they kill the gambler or they get rid of him, depending on the story. They shoot him off in the sky, whatever. And I've argued with another colleague that that, that might have been the end of that lineage, right? Like we're done with this, we're not doing this anymore, we're gonna change our ways. But anyway, you compare it to other places, but one of the things you look at is Ken Bignola, you see the women have seven out of 11 have trauma. Ken Bignola has a lot of women that, higher rate of women and then women with trauma, and I've argued that area might have been where they were having the forced labor. And that, there's an archeologist in the 70s that basically called that site the gateway into the canyon. So that was like the outskirts site where people lived and you couldn't get to the canyon unless you went through there. That would be where you'd have your labor, right? And your people, you wouldn't have them in the main sites. Overall, 28.6% of the population or 72 out of 252 had some sort of cranial trauma, some lethal. But when we look regionally, that might, it's not as much as other places. Um, I've done this, like I said, regionally with other groups. I did it in the Columbia Pateau. We went through and looked at it in 2016. We published on that. It's relatively low rates of trauma. But when we also looked at the Fremont and did it in a book called The Frontiers and Borderlands, Bioarchaeology of Frontier and Borderlands, this is a really cheesy map I drew just showing you the outline of the differentiation between them. But those colors are more meaningful. The light blue is the Fremont. The green is the Cayente Ancestral Pueblo. And the red are Virgin branch kind of, or ancestral Pueblo. So different groups, three different groups, and we looked at trauma among them. And we found some, 12% in both Virgin and Cayente, but if you look at the Fremont, that's 72.5% had trauma. Do you remember back to the rock art when we were looking at like heads and scalps and it's holding up, but when we break it down by location and stuff, there's also stress at different times and it's probably only later in time. So. It's always important to think about cycles of violence. It's not inherently that they were, Fremont were violent, there was something going on, right? But higher rates in certain areas can tell us things about history, what people were doing, and some of this violence. Now, back to this extreme processing sites. It, every red site you see on the map of the four corners has individuals that were chopped up, burned, cut up. Now, there's a guy, Christy Turner, and his wife that, uh, Catherine Turner, whoop. Yeah, that wrote a book called Man Corn. I'm not a big fan of it. I obviously have a, a blocked out. Uh, the reason I'm not a big fan of it is they argued it was cannibalism. Every time I get called to talk about these sites, or some one of my friends, Ventura Perez, who's done more work on this than me, it's always like, talk about the cannibalism. He's like, no. In fact, they got him on video talking about cannibalism one time, and then they kind of edited it in a way that it's not all that flattering, because he's anti-cannibalism. But they all, it's all about cannibalism. I mean, they called the book Man Corn, right? Like they were running around eating men because they ran out of corn. All right. We have no evidence for cannibalism. There's one site where they found coprolite, which is fo like fossilized poop, and they ran analysis on that, and they said, oh, that's human. It's got human myoglobin. They, they sent it to one lab. The one lab had never worked with archaeological material. There's like a guy that's like, that's his specialty. And so we don't even know if it's true or not, right? Like they should have split it and sent it to two labs and done proper science, but they did not. Um, even if there's cannibalism, that's not, the, that's not the question. The question is why were they processing over the time frame of 600 um, AD to 1600 AD? So like a thousand years of these different sites popping up, right? And these, people have talked about these. There's periods of peace, what Chaco, when Pueblo Benito's in power, it's considered peaceful times. I mean, there's violence, I just showed you some, but it's, it's relatively low violence. There's not the massacres as much, but there's still some. Um, and some of these are not even massacres. Some, but Ventura thinks some of them might be secondary processing of your ancestors, so you're processing, could be witchcraft killing. But my uh, colleagues wrote a book, Massacres, I gotta write the conclusion for the book, which is I've never done, which was kind of fun. But kind of summarizing what they were talking about and then thinking about massacres in general. And I talk a lot about like, when we think about these, which Deb Martin and others are still working on all these sites, we really have to think about it more nuanced than just cannibalism. In fact, the checklist he had for cannibalism could be used for witchcraft killing, which Andy Darling and others have said that for years. Um, it could be used for lots of things, but it's, it's just a more complex picture when you start thinking about what people are doing. But it, it's obviously ideologically related because it wouldn't persist that long. If you had a horrible thing like, think about genocide. It's not like you're gonna do it again the next time, right? There's something ha that's kind of reinforcing this. Aztec heart sacrifices the same way. Um, blood sacrifice in Europe. I mean, all these things, when you look at sacrifice, there's ideology behind it. Sometimes people voluntarily in some ways become sacrificial victims. 
right? I mean, we talk about sacrifice in the Bible, right? There's sacrifice events and stopping of sacrifice. People have done this worldwide. The question becomes what, more interesting than cannibalism, why was the purpose? And you can read all about it. There's a lot of books on violence. These are just some of the books. My grad student, Aurora Perez, who's a PhD student in Mexico, and she's not, I'm on her committee. But she came up to Alaska and spent the semester with me working on studying violence in the past. And she pulled this slide together. I've added a couple more since then, but there's just constantly new work coming out. But the oldest stuff is some of the stuff that Deb did and others in the early 90s. So 97 was the first bioarchaeology of violence textbook. The others are anthropology related or art archaeology related, but then look how many have been produced since then. And I'm in a bunch of these, so that might be why somebody said I was <laughs> focused on violence, I don't know, maybe. Uh, but I, it's just the nuance behind why people do it, right? Why do people engage in activities? And sometimes it is a solution to a problem. Sometimes it's ideological, it's part of what you should do. Sometimes it's correcting the world, like getting rid of bad magic or witches, right? Each one of these just kind of explores that in different ways. Warfare. Um, cannibalism, I didn't put it up there, but it's, you can read that one too. But the point of all that, looking at all these different things, is that we're not even finished. There's so many new techniques that are coming because we're, we're constantly asking better questions. I think that questions I asked maybe 10 years ago aren't as good as the questions my grad students are asking now or my colleagues that are younger than me are asking because they're asking different things. But they're also using better techniques. This is uh, tartar. How many of you had tartar in your life? and had it removed. Everybody's had tartar, right? Well, you all had something. They can get DNA from tartar now, and so that's not even destructive. I mean, it's like going to the dentist. They just clean your teeth, take the, take the tartar and run DNA samples. That's awesome. I mean, it's really changing a lot. And it tells you two different things. It tells you DNA, but it also tells you about micro, um, microorganisms, right? So it's gut bacteria, other things. It tells you a lot like what people are eating. So they're looking at what foods people are eating, Maybe diseases is in there as well. And this has just started maybe 2014 is when it was coming out, and it's really grown over the last half decade. Um, but yeah, now we're just, and you know what, tribes are okay with it. You don't necessarily have to destroy the bone, you just have to clean the teeth. Okay, we can do that. They've done it on Neanderthals, which is cool. But um, changing the game, right? There's one of a Mayan sacrifice victim that I put up here just because I thought mm, this is interesting when they did blue fibers found in the dental calculus of a Mayan sacrifice victim. So they found 100 sacrifice victims were buried in Belize's Midnight Terror Cave during the Mayan classic period, 8250 to 925. And so then they started detecting and they found fibers. Now, interestingly, I saw a, a different article where one of the professors is at the University of Pittsburgh <laughs> and they were like arguing, well, I don't know about these fibers. That's the cool thing about science, right? Somebody finds some new evidence and then we kind of debate it back and forth. I, I hate cannibalism, maybe you find somebody likes to talk about cannibalism. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, I'm just, I think that's not the answer. Um, but just interesting things that are coming out because people are able to do this new research and look at what the bones are telling us, right? So we're always gonna continue reading the bones, it's just different ways to do it. Maybe more ethical ways, right? We have DNA now, we have isotopes, we have radiocarbon dates and we have dental calculus and there's more. People are doing more interesting stuff. I was at a conference in Seattle last month, and one of the guys at the conference with me, he's a grad student of one of my contemporaries, and he's studying hair and looking at um, serotonin and stuff in the hair, like different things. So, <clears throat> excuse me, he's doing like hormonal stuff with hair, which is cool. I'm like, oh man, now I wish I had hair, right? Because when I was looking at trauma and violence, like think about that. I have found hair archeologically, but now, Anyway, just different questions. And the reason they can do that is they have mummies in Peru because of a process of they would put them in cold conditions and mummify the bodies. Lots of things to think about. Um, bodies, all that. So at this point, I was gonna stop and see if you had questions and I can go back and look at anything, but just what we can learn, where we're at with bioarchaeology, and hopefully in the future, more better researchers than me will do even better stuff. But yeah, questions? Oh yeah, yeah, because people don't randomly put bodies places. Now, do people do bury people sometimes in refuse pitch, which seems disrespectful, but sometimes that's just economical, right? Like they do that on purpose, but they still bury them with custom. So think about what you do when your loved ones pass. I mean, we all do something, right? 
cremate them, put them in an urn, you bury them, you put them in a cask. I mean, we, we all do some sort of respectful type burial, but when people deviate from that, and what we do is look site specific, right? If the culture is all doing one thing and then all of a sudden you got these outliers, we used to call them deviant burials, we don't use that term anymore, but we try to figure out why. Yeah, but yeah. You definitely don't bury yourself, right? That's the one thing I tell my students. Like, the bones are a reflection of you. The burial is a reflection of your society and your family, right? If you're poor pauper, what happens to your body? You end up in a medical school or Garrett College. <laughs> we, have, we have a donated skeleton. It's like, ah, uh, you know. I mean, that probably was somebody from South Asia that was poor, and they just sold the body when they died. That's how they used to get skeleton collections. They used to just take them from the poor people, macerate them. Sounds horrible. Other questions? <laughs> Where do we get these things? Yeah. Yeah. It's because it was named when they thought, oh, the Aztecs must have done this, right? Uh, yeah, it's way far away, <laughs> right? Yeah, but it, it got that name because of the Aztecs. Yep. There's a lot of thoughts about what these were. I mean, if you remember the really a long time ago, they were telling Coronado the lost city of the gold were up in that way, right? And he headed off to Kansas, disappointed. Right? There's no gold in Kansas. <laughs> they were trying to get him out. But yeah, those so they got named many years ago. But interestingly, just as an archaeological thing, we've, we've learned a lot because the Spanish were naming stuff like all the way up into Alaska and the Northwest Coast. They didn't really tell people a lot of that stuff until later, like where records are released, but you get like Straits of Juan de Fuca and stuff in like all these places. And I'm like, why is that in Washington? Spanish were everywhere. <laughs> they were doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 14 does. Yeah, they're, they're getting older. So Metacroft used to be, it, it's funny you say that though. It's a, it's a debated site. I'm just gonna put it up here. Um, they, at one time they said 20,000 plus years for Metacroft. Yeah, and the reason, there's debates. I mean, each one of these sites, I've heard, I'm still being recorded, huh? Well, anyway, there's lots of debates about each one of these sites. Um, Metacroft is one of those where they're like, oh, those stones you're finding, those fell, those are natural rock fall. And so then they just, I mean, people go back and forth. The Monte Verde one, they had a 30,000 year old date on that originally. They had fire that was found, but then they've argued that was a natural burn. So it was a wildlife fire that came through, and so it's not human. But just as a side note, just something they found recently, Homo naledi is a really old fossil that they found in Af South Africa. They just found evidence that, that that ancestral person was cooking. There's evidence of processing and cooking so we know, I, I mean, I've always thought humans were using fire for a long time, but anyway. New stuff, that came out like this week. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. Yeah, but Metacroft, you all should go. It's pretty cool, it's just right up there, it's not very far. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Vultures, <laughs> vultures are interesting. Um, burials, I didn't talk about them in here, but vultures are used in burials oftentimes. There's a site, really old site in the Near East in Turkey Chetahuic, 9,000 years old, and they like have vultures processing human remains on motifs of it and stuff. And it looks like archaeologically they're doing it. Yeah, birds help. <laughs> they clean bodies. Yeah, you could do that here, I suppose. But green burials are coming back, by the way, if you haven't heard of that. That's where you're not embalming and burying. They want to just let you naturally process. I'm a big fan. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. You could just put you down. Yeah, um, and I, I did try to keep this North America focused just because we were doing this for Indigenous Peoples Month and so Indigenous Earth Month. So, but I mean, around the world there's cool stuff. People are buried in pots in Southeast Asia. One of my friends looks at some of that. I mean, there's just fascinating stuff that's kind of globally. Um, but same here. I mean, our history is 15,000 years old and it's pretty cool. Other thoughts, questions? Bones still scary. Everybody thinks it's weird. I, I love what I do. I mean, I, I'm a dean now, so maybe that's different. But I love studying human remains because, it, like everything, I mean, 
I think about myself. Nobody's going to know who I am when I die, right? Maybe they'll read a publication, one of those dumb books I wrote. But they're not going to know me. I'm not that level of society, right? But like, if somebody, I'm going to donate my body to science. So if somebody comes along someday, they might know a quick story I'll tell you about my body. I broke my arm three times. Once when I was five, once when I was 10, and once when I was 15. I know there's a pattern. When I was 20, I was like, nobody's touching me. But I'll tell you the stories real fast. Uh, when I was five, I thought I could do a backflip. My sister's much older than me. She's like 13 years older. She had a cute friend, and I was like, now's the time. So I went to do a backflip in front of her, and I kind of flopped in the air and broke my arm. And they laughed, and then they took me to the hospital. <laughs> so broken arm. All right, well, that's once. When I was 10, I got on back of a Clydesdale that I didn't own, and I was like, I'm going to ride this Clydesdale, right? My friend dared me to. I was like, sure, I'll do it. So I got on the Clydesdale, went out, it went out in the pasture, it reared up and landed on me, but I was in the mud, so I just sunk, right? So then I walked half a mile up to my friend's house and sprayed off with the hose and then got back on the Clydesdale. <laughs> Not the smartest guy. But my, I, this time I had a plan. I'm like, get my friend on the back, two of us, much better. It's like he kicks the horse and the horse takes off running. And so I'm holding on to the mane. There's no saddle, right? This is just some guy's horse and a, I don't know the guy. And I, I'm like leaning towards a thorn bush. I leaned f the other way to miss the thorn bush and I hit a billboard post. Like a, Telephone pole. <laughs> yeah. I did a backflip. I didn't remember any of that, but my friend said it was awesome, and I landed on the ground, and I had broken my wrist. Anyway, 15. I'm wrestling around with my friend who's about six foot six, 350, 400 pounds, and I'm in like this stance where my fingers are down, and he jumps on my back, and I dislocate my thumb. And I'm like, I could put that back in. So I just pop it back in. I can't do that, by the way. <laughs> so, you know. Anyway, three days later, it's black and blue. My mom's like, what'd you do? And I had shattered the bone, so I had to go to the doctor, and they broke it again and then reset it. So that's the three times. But I bring that up and I can't really show you, but like this hand is my dominant hand. I lift more weights with this hand, it's stronger, but this arm is smaller. If I put a watch on this wrist, it's about a size and a half smaller. And the muscles in this arm are smaller. It's permanently atrophied and it will never change because I broke it three times, right? And so if I die, well, we all die, but if I die, somebody's gonna look at those bones and they're not gonna know when I broke them unless I write that down, but they're gonna be like, that guy broke his arm three times in three different places and they might think I did all at one time, but probably not because of the location. That's one of the things when we try to look at multiple traumas. They're all different like causes physically, right? If, if I looked at the physics of it, I did them different. So that's the bioarchaeology of me. My professor, Deb Martin, she wants to write that book someday before she passes. And when she's older, she wants to write the bioarchaeology of me and think about all the things that happened to her in her life and then what would show up on the bones, right? And you can do it with x-rays, but kind of stories we tell. But nobody knows those stories until you start to see them. And again, in the past, we often think about those elites, but it's like those everyday people that we're trying to retell stories of, right? Who are these captives? Who are these people who are just farmers that nobody knows about, right? Those are the people that are fascinating, to me at least. Anyway, that's my last story. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Oh. <laughs>